Okay, uh, let's get started. We actually have a lot to do today. Sorry for the slight delay. I was trying to see if I could push today's homework back a couple hours. I, it may have worked. I clicked 5 p.m. and then it crashed, so I don't know if it worked. Um, and here, here's the reason I want to do that. I want to start today. We actually have a bunch of things we need to get done today, but I did want to start today briefly with a little review of momentum. In particular, I wanted to address some, homework, uh, some questions I've gotten over email about the homework. Um, so far, this is, the, this is the concept. We're talking about momentum. It's a new framework for understanding the world. And here's the main utility of this thing called momentum. Well, let me first just define it. The momentum is the product of your mass and velocity. So as I described earlier, um, a rock, a boulder just sitting there is not scary. Uh, a bullet or some other projectile just sitting there is not scary. It's with the product of mass and velocity, which can be very scary. And so a train can be rolling at you very slowly. You still want to get out of the way. Same with a boulder, probably. And so this product of mass times velocity, that's what we call momentum. And if you want to change something's momentum, you apply an impulse. That's F delta T there. If you push on something for a certain amount of time, that's called applying an impulse. The product of how hard you push and how long you push, that product is the change in momentum. So if I have two objects with equal momentum, I can change their momentum equal amounts by pushing on one really hard for a short amount of time, or I can push on another one for not very long, or not very, not very hard for a longer amount of time. As long as, so if, as long as F delta T is the same product. And so as I mentioned, like in a car crash, that's why you have an airbag. When you're, when you're driving down the car on a road, you have momentum, P, MV, your mass times your velocity. Eventually that momentum is gonna come to a stop. You want, that's gonna happen. So if you're driving down the road and you need to come to a stop, you're gonna come to a stop, that has to happen. You've got two options. You can do it for, with a really big push for a short amount of time, like just running into a wall, or you could do it with a slow push for a longer amount of time. Usually it's more comfortable to do the latter. So a lot of the devices in your car, even the seatbelt tensioner, is designed to prolong a collision. Or if I were to throw you a water balloon or a raw egg right now, you probably wouldn't just go whoosh. You would probably go, whoa. And every time, if anyone's ever thrown you an egg or a water balloon and you went, whoa, what you're doing is you're prolonging the collision. If you just put your hand out like that, the, it's gonna break. So it's the same change of momentum. I throw you an egg, it's got momentum. There's nothing you can do about that. But you wanna increase the delta T and then lower the F. That's what you're doing when you cradle a catch. Okay. I think that's about it. And so the, the other thing that we saw last class, oops, I don't even see Rebecca, but uh, what we saw is that if I have a system that has some momentum and that system has no forces acting on it, I know that momentum will be conserved. It won't change. So the reason I put Rebecca on a little wheelie cart was to try to remove any external forces, no friction, no air resistance, anything like that. So when she's sitting on the cart at rest with a bunch of carbon dioxide, that the total momentum of that system was zero. She had no momentum. Then when she starts throwing carbon dioxide molecules that direction, the total momentum of the, of the system has to stay zero because there's no forces, no F on the system. So if there's no forces on the system, the momentum of the system can't change. But if I see a bunch of things at rest, all of a sudden something is moving that way, in order to make that true, in order to make the total momentum still be zero, something goes this way. And that we talked about, like if you fire a cannon, and the, the cannon and the cannonball are at rest. If all of a sudden the cannonball is going this way, something has to be going this way, by definition. And so when Rebecca was shooting carbon dioxide molecules really fast that way, she shot enough of them and enough of them fast enough that it was, she was able to propel herself. But what you were watching was the conservation of momentum. You were watching the total system keep its momentum. Stuff going that way made stuff go this way. I think that's the whole, uh, I think that's the whole picture. Um, let's see, we also, so we talked about how that idea, that, that concept of throwing stuff this way can be a really good way to get around Especially at the top there, I've got, a, I've got that same picture. There's the Earth on the left. There's our moon that's drawn to scale. It's a scale representation. There's the moon on the right. 
If you want to get from that place to that place, you, you're, most of your traditional forms of, of, of transportation aren't going to work. There's no road or bridge there, and there's actually no air. And so roads and bridges are great for cars and bikes and pedestrians. There's no lake, so you can't take a boat. And you also can't take a plane because if in that picture, the, the stuff that planes fly in is about one pixel wide, even probably less than that. And so a plane could get you from the Earth to uh, about a mile, well, six miles above the Earth or something, not too far. And so if you want to traverse that distance, you have to come up with a mode of transportation that doesn't rely on water or roads or bridges or air. And so the best one we've come up with so far is take a bunch of stuff with you and throw it out gradually. That's what a rocket is. You just gather up. So that's what Rebecca had. Rebecca had a tank of compressed carbon dioxide, and she started throwing it out. And that's what rockets do. Is, and that's why the, down and below there's a picture of Saturn V. There's the five rockets. There's a human for scale. And you can't even see, just due to the perspective, you can't even see where the, the people who rode in that thing rode. But it's a tiny, tiny capsule way, way, way at the top. That thing is like uh, 38 stories tall. And it's in the top half a story they put the people. The other 37 and a half stories are just, is just a big tank of gas. And so that's the downside, I guess, of rockets, is you have to take your gas with you. And you just put all that gas in there, and you just start throwing it out gradually over the course of your, of your flight. Now, eventually, you end up with an empty gas tank, and they tend to shed that weight. So if you've ever watched a multi-stage rocket like the Saturn V, or even our space shuttle, rest in peace, uh, they, they launch, and then they, once they're done exhausting that fuel, they'll let go of the gas tank. And then they'll and maybe empty out another one and let go of that one. So Saturn V, I think, was three stages. And so it would blast off, then drop some, then blast that, then drop some. Anyway. Um, oh, by the way, one other thing I wanted to mention uh, before we move on. Last class, I mentioned this whole crazy endeavor of blasting people off the Earth with the Apollo program. And the first guys to do it, we blasted these guys off our planet. They flew through the black emptiness, darkness of space without cell phones or internet, made it to the moon. And then Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and some other guy made it there. And Buzz and Neil were able to walk on the, or walk on the moon. And then that other guy had to be flying around. Um, I felt bad that I couldn't remember his name. I thought it was Pete Conrad. That was a different guy. So there, I made a slide for him. There's Michael Collins. He's still alive. He's 85. I looked, just read his Wikipedia article a minute ago. He's 85 years old. He's a two-star general in the Air Force. Not a forgettable guy. So I feel bad that just because he didn't walk on the, on, the, on, the, on the moon that his name is less uh, memorable to history. But there he is, Michael Collins. Started his own company. What else did Wikipedia say? I forget. Oh, I'm doing it again. No, but anyway, Michael Collins, two-star general. Remember his name. He's awesome. OK. Um, I'll say the last, last thing at the end of class, uh, yeah, last class on Wednesday, we ran out of time. People were packing up. And I rushed through my demo. So I got to crush some Coke cans before I do anything else. And here's why I want to crush these Coke cans. And this is actually, I was rushing through this point. So I do want to reiterate it. This is actually, a, this is an important one. Because what we're about to talk about is those other ways we like to get around. Uh, there's our Earth again. And if you have a device if you're, if, as long as you're happy just staying in that blue part, you can use airplanes. We're going to talk very briefly today about airplanes, and then we're going to get on to some other stuff. But here's what you need to know about airplanes. They, it's amazing that we can fly them. I think it is amazing. There's, pretty much every day, there's something amazing we're going to talk about. So a 747 loaded up is about a million pounds. A mil if, just, if you've ever stood next to a, an Airbus 380 or a Boeing 740, uh, 747, it's crazy that, that we've even uh, we looked at that and thought, yeah, that'll fly. It's so heavy. It's like a million pounds. But so in order to take something that's a million pounds and get it off the ground, there has to be something pretty substantial going on. And it's taking advantage of air and air pressure. And we tend, like I said last class, we tend to think of air as very insubstantial, that it's just we take, we take it for granted every day. But it's relatively substantial, substantial enough that you can fly a 747 with it. So the the surface area of the wings of the 747 are, are big enough that just a slight pre pressure differential, we can lift that thing up. And uh, it turns out that you only need about a one pound per square inch 
pulling up on each square inch of the airplane on the wings, and it lifts up. But um, we're getting ahead of ourselves. The, uh, what I wanted to, us to remember last, what I wanted us to see last class is so that there's this, I wanted us to maybe think about how substantial air actually is. So this much air right here, about like what, two feet cubed or so, that's a pound. You think of air, I mean, you think of air weighs nothing, it weighs nothing. This is a pound of air. Like, air is, I mean, you don't have to get much of it, about this much, and all of a sudden you have a pound of air. We did the math, the, the, the air in this room is over a ton, but it's so easy just to, to take it for granted. And so as a, as a pretty good demonstration of how substantial air is, what I wanted to do was simply remove the air from one of those cans. That's it. If I just remove the air from one of those Coke cans, the air on the outside will crush it. Because the only reason me, you, that Coke can, everything in this room isn't crushed into a ball right now is because there's a pressure equilibrium where something on the inside is pushing out to prevent you from being squished. So right now, on, if you were just to hold your hand out, on one inch of your hand, there's 15 pounds of air pushing on that on your hand. Add up, I mean, my hand is maybe 10 square inches. That's 150 pounds in my hand right now. That's a lot of weight, 150 pounds. I definitely cannot curl 150 pounds. But fortunately, there's 150 pound, pounds pushing on the other side. And so it's not difficult for me to move my hand. But there's about 150 pounds pushing on your hand right now. There's another 100 pounds pushing on your head. It's a lot of pressure. So that is a substantial amount of pressure. So if you've ever, let me try to think when you would ever, uh, an example of what you would, like if you've ever drank something out of a straw, you, the tendency is to think that you are sucking water up into your mouth with a straw. There's really kind of, there's no such thing as that. that. That doesn't really work. Here's what's happening is you're, you've got a, you're at the restaurant, you've got a big Coke and you put a straw in there. The top of the Coke, the surface of the liquid is being pushed down on 15 pounds. That's a lot. There's 15 pounds pushing on every square inch of the Coke. And then you put a straw in. And all you have to do is lower the pressure at the top of the straw and air will push fluid, will push Coke up in through the straw. So that's how you're drinking. You're not sucking it up. You're not creating a vacuum. All you're doing is lowering the pressure at the top. All you have to do is expand the cavity of your lungs or even just your mouth and you can lower the pressure at the top, and what's actually happening is air is pushing on the surface of the drink and pressing it through the straw. Or even a simpler example, if you've ever taken a breath, you're doing the same thing. Take a breath right now, you're not sucking in air. The 30 miles of air above you is shoving air into your head and you're just letting it. So when you're not breathing in, all you're doing is not letting air go in, into you. But all you have to do is lower the pressure in your lungs the tiniest bit, and all, then air does what it is trying to been trying to do all day, and that's go to a low place of low pressure. And so it's it's pretty substantial stuff. So really quickly, what I'm going to try to do here. And so last time I ran, I did it too fast. So I'm going to try to try to uh, give it time this time. So I've got a little bit of there's a little bit of water in there, and I'm going to add. So this is liquid water. Liquid H2O, I'm going to add some thermal energy to that. Thermal energy can be measured by bouncing. So the, the water molecules are going to bounce around more, bounce around more. And eventually, most of them are going to start hanging out as a gas rather than a liquid. So I'm going to turn liquid water, which is very, very dense, into water vapor, which takes up a lot more space. And that, here's the whole reason I mentioned that. All that water vapor is going to push the air out of that can. So if I can get this thing boiling, this thing will not have any air left in it. It's still not being crushed because the air, the water vapor in there is at 15 PSI, pounds per square inch. The air outside here in the classroom is 15 pounds per square inch. And so I've got equilibrium. But what's, what, what I want to think through is what's happening, the only reason this isn't being crushed right now is the air is trying really hard to crush this can. But inside there's equal pressure from the gas. When I flip this upside down into this kind of cold water here, when I flip it upside down, the, the water vapor is going to condense back into, back into liquid and it'll take a much less volume. And now I've got nothing on the inside but a tiny bit of water, no air, and then air on the outside, and that should crush the can. And again, I'm being impatient, but I'm going to really make sure it's boiling in there. Sounds like it is. Okay. So then, once that, then, then I'm going to have 
15 pounds on every square inch of can. So if you've ever stood on a can, I weigh 170 pounds, that's about the same amount of pressure. So you can imagine standing on this can, it's about the same amount of force that's going to act on this can. It's spread out over the surface, but it's the same amount. There we've got some good boiling. All right, that should do it. Let's try it. And I, I'll be even more patient if this one doesn't work. I'm, I've got a lot to do today. Not bad. I think we could do one more. OK. Um, but you saw that. So again, you just watched. You just watch the sides of a can seemingly magically just go in, inward. That's what they want to do all day long. While they're just sitting there, it's, that is constantly being, they're being bombarded by 15 pounds per square inch. It's just the pressure on the inside that's preventing it from doing that. Let's make sure I've got, that is pretty hot. Just want to make sure I got water in there. OK. All right. Um, while that's boiling, let's see if we can start talking about uh, Light. I've got about minutes, maybe five minutes, actually, is all I want to spend on this other type of flight, and then we're going to move on. Here's the main thing. This is, um, here's the main thing I want us to know in this class. Uh, you may have heard at some point in your life that here's how planes fly, is that there's this particular shape called an airfoil, and the air hits the front of the airfoil, and it splits, and I've got air going over the top, and I've got air going underneath. The air that goes over the top, it takes longer because it's a longer path because it's kind of bumped up. And so the air going over the top takes longer because it's a longer path. Or no, it has to go faster. It has to go faster because it's a longer path in order to meet up with its friends on the other side of the wing. And because it goes faster, it less pressure or something like that due to Bernoulli effect. That's false. So I'd love to dispel that myth. That's not how planes fly. In fact, that picture up there is, is is not the type of wing I was just describing. Most wings are longer on top. They're kind of bulged on top and flat on the bottom. Here's a wing that's actually symmetric. You can fly a wing that is symmetric. That, it's possible. So the whole idea that air moves faster because it has to take a longer path means like the air cares about getting back to its friends or something. It, it's, it's false. So I, here's what I want us to realize that, well, first of all, flight's super complex. We're not, Understanding the, the physics behind it is definitely uh, not, I don't want to totally get into that today. But there's a couple things going on. It's kind of uh, Newton's third law in that, so you can see that I've got an animation of a plane and it's starting to take off. And when you start to take off, you nose up. If you ever fall, fall in a plane, you get barreling down the runway. And when the pilot decides it's time to take off, he just noses up a little bit. And when you nose up, all of a sudden you've got air molecules hitting the bottom of the wing. It's that complicated. That's a big part of the lift, is you're just you're just pushing against air molecules. So you're going really fast like this, and you're going to start lifting off. Imagine if you were to hold a, like a, I bet that's boiling by now. But uh, if you were to hold a ping pong paddle out of the car when you're driving, hold it totally flat, or maybe even just your hand, and then just tilt it. It's going to go up. So it's about that hard. If you want to fly, that's kind of what you need to do. You need to get moving very fast through a fluid like air, and then tilt your wing up. Change your angle of attack. But then also what you can see in the bottom, the bottom middle pictures, and you're also seeing it up at the top a little bit. What planes are very, the plane wings are very cleverly designed to create a pressure differential. And as I mentioned, a Boeing 737 only needs a pressure differential of about a pound per square inch in order to fly. This one better work. I'm, I'm, that's got to work. I think that's as good as it's going to get. Okay. Um, thank you. So I think that's, that's, that's pretty crushed. And oh, I could even zoom in on that. I'll zoom in on that in a second. Uh, that's pretty good. So, but so a, seven, a Boeing 747, it's got 15 pounds on the bottom of the wing. All it has to do is lower on average from 15 on the bottom to 14 on top. It'll fly. So if every pound of inch, every, if every square inch of the wing has just one pound pulling on it, which isn't much. It's about the weight of a Coke. If it has one pound pulling up on it, you can get the thing to fly. And so what you can see in, that, in this picture, you can see the blue means low pressure. And so all you have to do is, or the, yeah. Yeah, the blue right there means low pressure. And so when you're flying your plane, you can create a little zone of low pressure. And then what this sequence of pictures is showing is that once you get this vortex to shed off the back, 
that plane on, that, on the far right, you've got a nice equilibrium. You've got a nice steady state of air. You've got a nice steady state of air. There's air flowing underneath. There's air flowing under, over top. And you've got a slight pressure differential at the kind of front quarter of the wing that is going to lift it up. And you don't, it doesn't have to be much. It doesn't have to be much. Like I said, on an average, like a pound per square inch, and the thing will fly. And then the, the animation on the top, what I'm trying to show is that you can get more and more lift the steeper you tilt your wing or the steeper your angle of attack until this nice flow. So that middle, all three of those bottom pictures, you're getting this nice flow over the top. You get this nice flow over the top. Then, but if, you're, if your wing gets too steep, that flow actually separates from the wing. And you get turbulent air behind the wing. And then also that nice pressure difference you had is gone. That nice pressure difference, pressure difference you had is gone, and you've got no pressure difference, and you have no lift. And that's called stalling. And so if you've ever like, seen stuntmen, sometimes they'll do it intentionally. They'll climb, climb, climb until their angle of attack is so crazy, they'll stall out. And you immediately see it. Uh, the phrase I've heard is, has a glide path of a set of car keys. It just flies through there like a set of car keys until they can regain lift. OK. My gift stuff. There it goes. OK. So right there, you can see the, the boundary layer separating. And then you're getting turbulent air behind the wing, and that's a loss of lift. OK. And very, very quickly, like I'm going to take like two minutes just to mention, that's also how a propeller works. A propeller is just a wing spinning around. So there's two ways I can use a wing to create lift. I can drive my wing through the air if I have just get going and I drive the wing through the air, I can create lift. Or I can just attach the wing to, the, to a motor and spin the, wind, the, the wing around. So that's really what a propeller is. A propeller is just a wing that you have just attached to the front of your plane. You're spinning that wing around. So what you need, what you need to create lift is to get the, wi the wing moving through the air. And if the wing is moving through the air, you can create lift. It's either moving through the air because it's attached to the sides of the plane, or you attach to the front of the plane and just spin it around. And so a propeller, you can see from the side, looks just like a wing. Slightly more complicated because uh, the, the outer parts of the propeller are moving much faster than the inner parts. If you think about it, the inside is moving slower than the tip. And the tip is moving much faster. So you actually have to kind of change your angle of attack along the propeller. But essentially, it's a wing attached to a spinning thing. OK. We're going to get through all this. One last thing I'm going to mention, if I want to fly around in the atmosphere, I can use propellers. Nowadays, uh, most planes that you fly on, unless, like, unless it's like little commercial, like little hobby planes, most planes use jets. It's actually not too dissimilar of an idea. Well, actually, the, the jet is a little more, it's a little closer to um, how, we were, how a rocket gets around. And it's about throwing stuff out the back. And so a jet is, yeah, a jet is a little more about just trying to throw stuff out the back. And so if you've ever flown on a jet, that's really kind of what it's doing. The difference being a rocket has all this fuel with it that it's combusting and throwing the combustion products out the back. What a jet does is designed to fly in air. Rockets are not. Rockets fly out in space. If you're going to fly in air, you have the benefit of being in a something you can just keep grabbing and throwing out the back. So a rocket has to carry everything it's going to throw out the back with it. All the fuel has to go with it. For a jet, and there's two pictures of jets, a jet can just grab air, give it some energy, and throw it out the back, and grab some more air, and throw it out the back. So it doesn't have to take the stuff it's going to throw out the back. All it has to take is the fuel to, to do the work to add energy to that, to that fuel. And just very briefly, you can see on the top picture, all a jet is is just a dozen or so fan blades, just like a propeller. It's a dozen or so fan blades. That is, the air comes in. Those fan blades really just compress the air. They just compress the air. And then you can see in the yellow part, this is very, very similar to how your, uh, the gasoline engine in your car works. You take compressed air, add a little gas to it, and light it. It explodes, and then boom, you get to the stuff going out the back. And so if I want to throw air really fast out the back of a jet, I take some air in. I compress it with that first set of like a dozen blades, take some air in compress it, spray some gasoline, some jet fuel in there, light that. That's the yellow part. It explodes. I get a rapid increase in pressure, and that goes out the back of the jet. 
that energy came from the work done in that combustion. So I put some jet fuel in there, light it, boom, that's a lot of work, a lot of energy I got, throw that out the back, my jet goes forward. Finally, the last, the bottom picture is, if you've ever stood next to a commercial jet, the fan blades are usually huge. What we've learned to do is take that same jet, just like at the top, that's like in a fighter jet, this is the big one you see uh, underneath like a 747. All we've done is take that exhaust that's going out really fast, have that exhaust go past a blade that turns the big blade in the front. And that big blade in the front can sort of recycle that energy. So the, as the air is leaving the plane, it's spinning up those front blades. And those front blades can take a lot of air. And notice a lot of the air just goes through that, uh, through that empty, empty part on the top and bottom. And so it actually never goes through the combustion chamber. It just is being pushed on by the big, huge blade. So the big, huge blade that you see on a front of a 747 or something, most of the air it's pushing on is just being pulled in, pushed on a little bit, and sent out the back without ever going through the combustion chamber. Then like maybe the middle 20% or so is being used for the whole compress, gas, explode, out the back thing. So it's sort of, it's added, it's getting a lot more efficient uh, use of the air by doing that. So there's your five minute summary of jets. Um, that's probably enough. Let's do an eye clicker. There's my crushed Coke can. All right. There. Okay. So here's the eye clicker. Um, pardon uh, the use of firearms in this example, but it, it gets the point across. So imagine you were, I don't think this is how you're supposed to shoot a Glock, but imagine you have a Glock at your hip and you're shooting it like exactly horizontally. I want to know, oops, I haven't started that clicker yet. So I want to know how long that bullet's going to be in the air. So you've got, you've got your Glock at your hip, and you shoot a bullet out horizontally, and it's going to go, and by the way, if this helps you do the math, I think it leaves going about 800 miles an hour. It's going 800 miles an hour. I want to know how long that bullet takes to hit the ground. Our clicker is firing up. Come on, our clicker. So A, half a second. B, five seconds. C, 10 seconds. Come on. Uh, my eye clicker is this computer. I'm gonna blame it on this system up here. Uh, try it now. There it goes. Okay. Is it was it working? Okay. Um, so a. Whoa. Super zoom in of me. Let's go back to. Okay. A about half a second. B five seconds. C about ten seconds. D you would never hit the ground. There are what? After it leaves the gun, there are no other forces acting on it. No. Oh, well, its own weight, yeah. It, yeah, gravity. Gravity, its own weight, yes. So the bullet has weight, that's it. Pardon? How tall am I? I am launching this thing from one meter up. Ten more seconds. No. Oh. Four, six, six, seven. Right. Okay. All right. Um, let's discuss. Not bad. Uh, let's discuss. It is possible, I said, uh, your typical Glock shoots about 800 miles an hour, I think. It is possible. So if you said D, maybe you just got the velocities wrong. Uh, it is possible to shoot something fast enough and never hits the ground. We'll probably talk about that next week. 
but the, if you were to shoot something about 17,000 miles an hour, it would, it would just go into orbit. And I guess it would eventually hit you when it came back around. But uh, it would, theoretically, you could do something where it would never hit, that, hit the ground. But this is not going 17,000 miles an hour. Let's see if we can. I guess I just have to tell you. All right, the answer is A. It doesn't take that long. It, uh, and if you don't believe me, there's a Mythbusters. They did it. They actually, they fired a gun in a big like airplane hangar. And so you'd think, OK, if I'm going to fire a gun indoors, this better be a very long hallway. It wasn't crazy how far. I mean, I guess do the math. It's going 800 miles an hour. It took a half a second. And so they fired it from about yay far, and it just, they, they were able to track it till it fell. So here's the whole reason I do that. And we've got exactly 10 minutes left in class. In the, exact, in the next 10 minutes, here's what we need to talk about. That all of the stuff we've talked about so far this year, uh, we've talked about news laws, we've talked about working energy, we've talked about impulse momentum. I have tried to keep all of those things in one linear dimension. So we've talked about trains or people running into each other or cars on tracks or whatever, balls rolling or th people th throwing something straight up. So if I've ever thrown something, I've tried, it, I've tried to have it be something straight up because all of these laws work in one linear dimension. What we, ha what we stayed away from until today I want to start talking about it. If I want to look at most situations, most situations I'm not stuck in just one linear. <laughs> I'm not stuck in one, in one linear dimension. I've got projectile motion where things are moving horizontally and vertically at the same time. But the nice thing is, for the next week or so in this class, when's spring break? In a week? Okay, for the next week, next three classes, um, we, w I, w I want to look at more complex situations, but here's the only complexity. We'll just have the same situations we've been talking about all year, but just happening in two directions simultaneously. So a bullet fired from a gun can be thought of as a bullet moving horizontally and vertically at the same time. And if I want to know what that bullet's going to do, I can look at its vertical situation. Well, vertically, it has no forces other than its own weight. So vertically, that bullet is going to do this. Vertically, it has one force. It's going to accelerate down at 9.8, regardless of what it's doing horizontally. And if I were to throw a projectile, same thing. I can look at the horizontal and the vertical situations separately. So before I waste any more time, let's. here's my best example of that. Um, I've got several demos up here. That, let's see if we can get through at least a couple of them. Um, right here, what I've got is a device that is about as close to me uh, firing a bullet as I can come up with. Right here, you'll see this is a little ball that I just pulled off here. This little ball is just stuck on this little axle right here. And here's another ball right there. When I flick this switch, this axle is going to move this way and knock that ball off. So this ball is going to just go flying, this ball is going to go flying and it's going to land somewhere over here. This ball is just going to slide off and fall straight down. You should be able to, if we're all quiet, you should be able to hear them, or you might be able to visually watch, they're going to hit the ground at the same time. And so you might think, if I take one ball and just drop it from this height, and I take another ball and really zing it from this height, the one that's moving, like the bullet, is going to take a lot longer to hit the ground. But let's try it. I'll stand over here. Let's try it, and I think you should be able to. You only heard one click. I'll try it one more time. But one, one moved pretty fast horizontally, and the other just dropped. So let's try that one more time. And I, I think you probably, can't, you probably can't watch both of them, so you just have to trust the sound. But you should only hear one, you should only hear one click. So let's try that again. So they'll both hit the ground at the same time. That's my best demo of that. Um, let's try, because we're running a long time, let me try my favorite one, just so I don't have to set it up again. Where'd that one go? Thanks. OK. And this one has an eye clicker associated with it. Let's, so everyone, quick, take a vote. So here's what this eye clicker is asking you. I have, I don't know if you've noticed, kind of hard to miss. There's uh, this is a dart gun up here. And across the room, I have a target. Let's see. Let's go back to 
OK. I have a target over here. And I have the, the, uh, there's actually a laser pointing straight through the dart gun. So a dart gun is one of those blow dart guns. You could blow, and a dart flies out of it. There's a laser pointing straight through the dart gun. And the laser is hitting this spot right here. So you can see the laser dot right there. Yeah? OK. So that's my, that's my, that's my sight. What I want to know, did I start the eye clicker? Yeah. What I want to know is when I fire this thing, so when I fire the, the dart, this target's going to fall. This target's going to drop. So the second I hit fire on the dart, this target's going to start falling. And then the dart should stick into the board up here. I want to know when that, I mean, it's going to fire pretty fast. So I want to know, is the, is the dart essentially going to hit right about here, right about where the laser is pointed? Or is it going to hit somewhere between, is it going to hit above the target, right at the target, or below the target? Is the dart going to hit here and the target will fall onto it? Or will I actually somehow manage to magically hit the bullseye? Or will I hit slightly above the target? Go ahead and take a quick vote, and we'll give it a try. It's angled up. It's ang yeah, right now, the dart is ink. The dart is pointed directly at that red spot. So the dart is pointed right here. And when I fire the dart, this thing's going to start falling. Okay. So the target will fall the second I fire the dart. There's a wire. There's a wire connecting the launch of the dart to that target. So the target will fall as soon as I hit go. Take five more seconds to vote. All right. Let's give it a try. So here's this nice dart. This is an official dart gun. So like I said, when I hit go, when I hit go, this thing should, the target should drop at the same time I hit fire. I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you guys see? I, I, do I have a? I gotta have a camera on that. That's amazing. Let's see. Uh, I'm just gonna go through all the cameras. I have no idea if one of the one of the presets is even on the. Yeah, it's not gonna be. All right. <laughs> There's no. Okay, we're just gonna have to. We're just gonna have to go out to full zoom. Okay, we're gonna try. That was me. Uh, can everyone? See? That, that has to be on camera. I'm gonna wheel that. No. I might be able. To, anyway. I don't even know where the camera is. It's OK. Um, but can you guys see? That is exactly in the center of the bullseye. So here's, what's, here's, ex here's what happened. When I, hit, when I hit fire, this thing launched, and this thing started falling. They were aimed at one another. If there was no gravity, <laughs> do you know what camera is over here? I mean, like, if, if there's a, is there a number that would get onto the target? Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. No, it, it, no pressure. You know, Manual. Oh, do the right. Okay. Smart. Okay. Um, so if, if there was no gravity, if we were conducting this experiment in space, what you would have watched is a bullet travel in a straight line or a dart travel in a straight line. And when this got released, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. There's no forces on it, no gravity. So it would have gone in a straight line. And you saw the laser. The laser was right on it, and it would have hit. We got out a bullseye. But we were on Earth where both the projectile both the projectile and the target were subjected to the same acceleration. So even though horizontally, this one's moving very fast horizontally, this one's moving only vertically, both are going undergoing the same horizontal. Nice, thank you. But we're gonna have to, we're gonna shoot. Oh, there I am. Okay, we're gonna. Okay, I'm gonna do it again. Um, both are undergoing the exact same vertical acceleration. So where this is gonna hit and where this is, both those two points are accelerating at 9.8 meters per second per second straight down. So let's try that one more time now that I've got the camera working. It better be just as good or sad. OK. So this, I'm going to take the same dart. This is my lucky dart. So you can see the laser is pointing right at the center of the target. And again, the same, same deal where. As soon as I hit launch, they will 
the target will fall and the, the target will fall to say as soon as I hit launch and the where the where the where the dart is headed and the target will both accelerate downward at 9.8. Let's give it a shot. Ah, don't ah. That's still great. I just hit a target. That's I, that's a good shot. That's a very good shot. I don't think anyone could hit a moving target from like 30 feet away. That is really good. I'm. We'll do it one more time, then I'll let you go. I think that's pretty great. All right, one more time, then we'll call it a week. We'll be on our weekend. Three, two, one, look. Hey. <laughs> oh, you know what? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. See you Monday. <laughs>